history. We spent all of last time talking about polymers, and then I started to tell you how some of these are made via radical reactions. So you begin with the initiation step. This is you start with no radicals and you generate radicals. This involves homolytic bond breaking. Often you do this with UV light or heat, and you need, uh, in particular, your radical initiator needs a weak bond. If you look up bond dissociation energies for bromine, for peroxides, they're all lower than you would expect for a typical sigma bond in an organic molecule. So we choose these molecules deliberately because they can, they can break, the bond can break in this way, such that each part of the sigma bond ends up with an electron. You can th think of this as promoting one electron from the sigma bond to the sigma star and then the bond breaks. Uh, you can do that either with light or heat. I showed you a couple examples of this. This one's kind of cute. It's a common one used in a lot of organic molecules, especially because it's spring-loaded so that when it makes these radicals, the molecule expels an equivalent of nitrogen gas. Uh, okay, so that's to get us started so we have a radical in the first place. What happens next depends on context. There's a lot of different reactions you can do with a radical. I'm starting out by showing you a polymerization reaction. Uh, and, and maybe before we do that, we should talk about uh, briefly about radical reactivity. So how should you think about a molecule that has an unpaired electron? Let's actually look at this tert butyl radical. It differs from tert butyl cation in the sense that it's neutral. There's no charge on that carbon. Uh, but its orbital structure is almost identical to the tert butyl cation. So I'm going to draw uh, the tert butyl structure. Uh, radicals often, <coughs> mostly, are sp2 hybridized <coughs> at, the, um, at the radical carbon. <coughs> and if they're sp2 hybridized at the radical carbon, that means that the unpaired electron must be held in a p orbital. It's not an empty p orbital. It's also not a filled orbital. It's a singly occupied orbital. So we'll just put a dot in there for the radical. Maybe we'll just put a single electron, okay? So this is no longer homo or lumo. It's a singly occupied uh, orbital. HOMO is the term we used for the highest occupied molecular orbital that has two electrons in it. LUMO is what we use for an empty orbital with zero electrons in it. When we have just one electron in it, we call it a singly occupied molecular orbital or SOMO. And people will, you'll, you'll hear radical uh, chemists talk about that kind of thing. Uh, the same things that stabilize charges also stabilize radicals. So radicals are stabilized by resonance. So resonance delocalization. They can also, <coughs> excuse me, also be stabilized by hyperconjugation. Okay, so which radical do you think is more stable? What do you think? 
What do you look for when you're looking for resonance stabilization? Being adjacent to a pi bond, really, right? You look for a, if you're positively, if you if you've got a positive charge, you want to look for resonance delocalization. You're looking for the plus charge to be adjacent to a pi bond. If it's an anion, you're looking for the negative charge of the lone pair to be adjacent to a pi bond. Similar, we can do the same thing with radicals. For radical resonance stabilization, you are looking for the unpaired electron to be adjacent to a pi bond. When that happens, you can draw a resonance structure that converts one radical into the other. And that would be like this. To get from one resonance structure to another, you take this single electron and one of the two electrons from the pi bond to form a new pi bond between oxygen and carbon. We'll use red for the new pi bond that we formed. And then uh, we have to account for the other electron in the pi bond, which goes back onto the other carbon that was involved in the pi bond. And so we see that the radical on the oxygen can now be on this carbon of the ring. And through a similar set of arrows, we can move the radical to be on this carbon. And then I won't draw the last set of arrows. I'll leave that to you in your notes. We could show that the radical could also be on this carbon. So sort of a similar pattern to the way we saw those horrible resonance questions from your previous exams where which carbons share the negative charge. You can do the same thing here which carbons share the radical, it follows the same pattern. A radical can be delocalized by resonance. Okay? And that's a favor favorable thing. So the radical on the right is more stable because of resonance delocalization. Similarly, we're going to see that, you know, where does hyperconjugation uh, play in? Remember, hyperconjugation is about donation of electron density from adjacent carbon hydrogen bonds into the singly occupied orbital. So uh, this would suggest that just like more substituted carbocations are more stable, more substituted radicals are more stable. So radical stability, how, why can't I spell stable? There we go. Radical stability tracks with carbocation stability. A lot of the things that you've learned so far for the stability of carbocations will also work with radicals. All right, questions about that? All right, so that allows us to go back to this first propagation step that I showed you last time and ask a question about regioselectivity and actually ask a question about what's going on here in the first place. Um, in terms of radical reactivity, you, as I said, you can think of radicals as reacting more or less like carbocations, only they have one electron. If radicals are essentially an electron poor species, you can think of them basically as electron poor, then in this reaction, you can think of the radical as the electrophile and the alkene as the nucleophile. So what we're seeing here is one of the electrons from the pi bond, the high energy electrons of our nucleophile, uh, is attacking the electrophile to make a new sigma bond. And then the other atom of the pi bond gets the radical. Does that make sense? If this were a reaction from chapter, whatever it is, <laughs> chapter 10, 
uh, and we had some kind of electrophile like HCl, we'd be showing the reaction like this. We make a new bond with the hydrogen and we would get an intermediate that has the positive charge on this carbon, right? In a similar way with radicals, I'm going to delete that now, in a similar way with radicals, uh, we form a new sigma bond with atom A and then atom B gets the radical. I want you to consider whether or not that's better than the alternative because the alternative would be to make the new sigma bond with atom B and have the radical on atom A. Those are two regio isomeric outcomes. Which do you think is better? Probably the one I drew first, right? We're just guessing. Okay, now why? More substituted, right? The radical, uh, and, and in particular, you're right to think of it as more substituted by seeing that atom B has more stuff on it. Actually, uh, the, it probably has more to do with resonance than it does uh, with substitution here because of what the group is that's on B. If this were an alkyl group, if the chloro were an alkyl group, you'd be right on with the substitution. For the chloro, there's actually something else that can happen, and that's resonance. Chloro has lone pairs. I can draw a resonance structure where one of those electrons, whoa, that's kind of fun, pink arrow, one of the electrons from one of the lone pairs on chloro can donate in to that singly occupied molecular orbital on atom B to create a new pi bond with an unpaired electron on chloro. That may look weird. You're like, I didn't know you could do that. Well, you can. Uh, lone pairs adjacent to radicals can stabilize radicals by resonance, just like pi bonds adjacent to radicals can stabilize radicals by resonance. Notice that the radical used to be on the carbon, now it's on the chloro. Notice that in this resonance structure, chloro has one, two, three, four, five, six, owns six, owns seven electrons. Okay. Somebody's mad because it looks like we broke the octet rule, right? Yeah, we did, but this, re this resonance still happens. Okay, well. Are you, pr are you prepared to storm out in anger or should we just move on? Um, as long as it's not on the test. Fine, I promise not to ask you to draw resonance structures involving chloro and a radical. Okay, um, that being said, you guys are gonna see, um, you're gonna see resonance structures involving chloro in 352. So um, I will go ahead and withdraw, if you wanna think of that as more substituted. Off the top of my head, I, uh, that is resonance. Off the top of my head, I'm not gonna be able to justify it other than to say, well, Chloro is not really a second row element, so actually having more than uh, eight electrons around it is allowed. Um, you ever seen sulfuric acid? No, make it stop. That's more than eight electrons. So, um, okay. Sorry for that diversion, but you're right.
if you, if you want to think about the B carbon as being more substituted, that kind of regioselectivity issue is important here and governs where the radical is. All right, can we all agree on that at least, sort of, okay. So what happens next in our polymerization reaction? You've, this is a propagation step because you've traded one radical for another. In this reaction, it turns out that, that making a radical is hard and so uh, we don't have very many radicals at all in solution. Uh, and so what this radical is mostly surrounded by is other non-radical starting material. And what we can do in a second propagation step is pretty similar to what we do in the first step. This single electron and one electron from the pi bond react to form a new sigma bond. Again, the regioselectivity of that sigma bond formation is going to happen such that the radical can be on the more substituted carbon. And then, if you want to look at what we've made, we just made a new sigma bond between the B carbon of the first radical and the A carbon of my second monomer. And you're starting to see where each successive propagation step adds on another monomer and gives you another radical, okay? Again, one of the electrons of the pi bond attacks the electron deficient radical to make a new sigma bond, that's shown here in red. Then the new unpaired electron ends up on carbon A of the second subunit. If we were using color to illustrate the individual subunits attached, here's the first one, which came from here. Here's the second one. And so we might continue. Step two can repeat indefinitely as that chain with a radical on the end, continues to add additional subunits. Does that make sense? So what we did on Friday was talk about polyvinyl chloride. And what I just showed you was putting on the first two monomers to this polymer chain. But adding on additional monomers is going to continue indefinitely, hundreds or thousands of times. Um, and that's because we've got, that's because we have plenty of unreacted monomers sitting around and because radicals are so uh, reactive. So I'm going to just sort of copy that. Whoops. Let's see. No, I don't want to update now. Cancel. Hmm. Where did the... Oh, there it is. Yeah. So after a while, we then have this larger polymer. Okay? That's one example of propagation step in polymerization. There's other reactions that we'll talk about, um, but that's, that's polymerization. Questions about that? Yeah? So does every, like, plastic polymer have a radical at the end of the polymer? Not every plastic polymer is made in this way, but those that are... Um, Oh, you mean at the end, whatever happens to that radical at the end, yeah. right? Okay, great question, and we'll talk about that because no, the plastics that surround you don't, don't currently have radicals on them. They have to stop. So um, that's where we get to the termination step three. <laughs> and these termination steps are relatively rare and the, reason, and the reason that they're rare is because they usually involve one radical finding another radical. Radicals are so reactive that as long as you've got 
uh, unreacted starting material monomer present, you're just going to keep going and adding on additional subunits. So the termination steps are rare. They, they often happen in polymerization when you run out of starting material. Uh, these termination steps involve going from something that is a radical to something that is not. I'll show you a couple examples of this. You're not going to like it because um, there's no set defined endpoint. Uh, but let me give you some examples of termination steps. So if bromine were our radical, we could have two bromine molecules find each other. And they could each react to give me a new sigma bond between bromines. That's termination because you start with two radicals and you end up with zero radicals. Um, or alternatively, a bromine could identify, could find a carbon-centered radical and generate a new bromine carbon bond. These are not, by the way, these are examples of termination steps. Uh, in the reaction I showed you for the polymerization, we, we have neither <laughs> bromine nor carbon radicals, so that's not what would go on here. Let's look at the radicals that we do have. Um, we said whatever our radical was that started the reaction and then in the terms of the polymer, we have uh, basically just the end, the radical end of the polymer. So let me show you an example of uh, a termination step between two individual radicals. Um, all right, so here we're looking at the squiggly line means that what's over here is the rest of the polymer. We're looking at the final two subunits of a big large polymer chain. And then over here, we'll look at the final couple of subunits of another large polymer chain. No. Termination step here would require these two large polymer chains to find each other, to form a new sigma bond, and then what you'd have after that is this sort of weird, uh, the polymer would, in this one situation, have sort of this weird head-to-head -head bond between chloros. Now notice how different that is from the general structure of the larger portion of the polymer where chloros are all on alternating carbons. At the spot where the radical terminates, you have chloros on adjacent carbons. That's really rare, but that's one of the ways that the reaction can shut down and end. There's another uh, couple of methods that I could show you, but that aren't really important for this class. This happens some of the time, but this is how the radical reaction shuts down. You need two of those uh, carbon-centered radicals on the growing polymer chain for one polymer and the other to find each other and make a new sigma bond. Yeah? Um, in this situation, could you explain this to me homo and limo, or would they just be like the non-homo Right, so how do you know who's the electrophile and who's the nucleophile? You, you don't really, they're both, they're both somos. <laughs> So you have the SOMO, the singly occupied molecular orbital of one radical reacting with the singly occupied of the other. Yeah. Okay. So notice there's some ambiguity for polymers. In some, uh, when, you, when you say, I want to buy a PVC tube, you know that most of that tube is made of this structure. Unless you go and ask the, the uh, business that made that PVC, you don't know what the end group, end group is that started the reaction. They could tell you, but it's not really put on the label. 
and you don't really know how the reaction ended, what the, what the termination was, whether it involved what I've just shown you here or something else. Nevertheless, the majority of the polymer has the structure that you would expect as long as you're not requiring yourself to really know what the end groups are. Okay, so those are examples of termination steps in radical polymerization. Any questions you want to ask about that? Yeah. Would termination be have to start with two radicals in order to get zero? Do you have to start with two radicals to get zero? No, there is something called <coughs> radical disproportionation, but I read about it once and I can't remember it enough to tell you anymore. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> for us, that's, yeah, for you, for us, this is how you end it. Yeah. Um, okay. So, Polymerization is only one of the major uh, uses for radical chemistry. You can also do this on small molecules. So I'd like to show you a few reactions involving small molecules and radicals. Uh, before we do that, are there other questions about initiation, propagation, termination steps? Okay. So what I'll show you now for, um, we've, we've done radical polymerization. This next reaction we're going to call radical halogenation. It's gonna involve using bromine or chlorine. We'll start with bromine, because that's simplest. <clears throat> I won't show you any of the initiation steps for this reaction, because I've already shown you them up here. Any of these are potentially good ways to do an initiation reaction. Probably, eh, fine, I'll show it to you. Probably for radical halogenation, the initiation step involves bromine and UV light. Okay? Um, and then your starting material for radical halogenation is just an alkane. So we'll keep this simple-ish. Let's use this alkane. And let's draw a propagation step that involves bromine reacting with the alkane. Now, in the, re in the radical reactions that you've seen before, one of the things we did was we had the pi bond act as a nucleophile to attack the radical. With an alkane, you don't have any pi bonds. And so what happens when, when a radical reacts with an alkane is something called, it's, a, it's gonna be a new reaction, something that you're not used to, it's called hydrogen abstraction. It's kind of like deprotonation, only it only involves unpaired electrons. So, Bromine will pull off a hydrogen atom, that is a proton with one of its electrons, to form a new bond between hydrogen and bromine. And the other electron in that carbon-hydrogen bond goes onto the carbon. Um, there were two hydrogens on that sp3 hybridized carbon. We abstract one of them. Abstraction is different from deprotonation. Deprotonation would look like this. Deprotonation involves a base pulling the proton off, but the two electrons in the carbon-hydrogen bond go to the carbon. Abstraction is a single electron reaction where the radical from, uh, 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 removes a hydrogen atom with one of its electrons, and then what's left behind is a single electron on that carbon. Okay, so some of you will think, some of you in terms of shorthand are gonna mess this up. You're thinking, oh, that's basically I'm deprotonating that carbon. No, we don't use deprotonation and hydrogen abstraction. We don't use those words in the same senses, right? Hydrogen abstraction means 
a radical removes a hydrogen atom and its electron. Deprotonation involves a base with two electrons, stealing a proton, and then two electrons are remaining behind. All right. So hydrogen abstraction gives you a new hydrogen bromine bond and creates what I'm going to call a carbon-centered radical. <clears throat> the radical used to be on bromine, now it's on carbon. Let's talk regioselectivity here. Why do you suppose there are, ooh, NMR question. How many different kinds of hydrogens are present in my alkane starting material? Two, okay? Two different kinds of hydrogens, and they're present in a two to three ratio. I showed removal of the CH2 hydrogen to give me a secondary radical. <coughs> Why did I not show formation of the primary radical? Here's, here's what formation of the primary radical would have looked like. Bromine would have abstracted a hydrogen atom and then the radical would have been on the primary carbon. Here are the two hydrogens that are left behind. What's the difference between those two? Substitution. substitution. So the radical that is more substituted should be more stable. The radical that is less substituted should be less stable. Radical bromination is the reaction that we're doing here. When you use bromine, radical bromination is selective for the more stable radical. So we're going to observe products for the secondary carbon-centered radical we're not going to observe products for the less stable primary radical. There are reasons for that. They're explored in your text. We could talk about them. Um, it has to do with uh, the stability of the radical intermediates. It also has to do with, um, well, it basically has to do with the stability of bromine radical versus you will see that if we were to use chlorine as our starting material, the reaction would not be selective. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. But for right now, it's important to know and probably to memorize that uh, radical bromination is selective to go through the more substituted, more stable radical. Okay? So if you're following along, this was an initiation step. This was propagation step one. Propagation step two is going to involve that secondary carbon-centered radical. And it's going to find Br2. How do you know that there's Br2 there? I thought we said that we turned all the Br2 into radicals. No, we didn't. We only did some. Radical initiation is very inefficient. Your reaction has alkene, uh, sorry, alkane starting material, bromine starting material, and once you turn on the UV light, you start to make a very, very small amount of radical. So what the alkane radical is likely to find is bromine, and then it can do a single electron reaction with bromine to make a new carbon-bromine bond. The carbon-centered radical abstracts a bromine atom, that is bromine with one electron from the sigma bond, uh, to form a new carbon-bromine bond. And then what's left is a bromine radical. Now hold on, I actually don't like the way I drew that new carbon bromine bond. What do you notice about this carbon? Stereocenter, right? 
And what also do you remember that I told you about the radical? What's the SOMO? P orbital, right? That empty elect that lone pair electron is held in a p orbital that's both above and below the plane of the page, which means that the bromine may be added both above and below the plane of the page, so we will get both enantiomers of the alkyl bromide. That's an important feature of radicals like carbocations. You can add to them from above or below, so you have to keep track of stereochemistry. So take a zoom out and take a look at propagation steps one and two. Notice that here we start with the bromine radical. We make a carbon-centered radical. Then the carbon-centered radical reacts to give us our product. But in addition to our product, we make another bromine radical, which goes back up to step one and cranks through another cycle. So this is what we call a chain reaction. Uh, we go through a cycle of bromine-centered radicals attacking alkanes to make carbon-centered radicals, then carbon-centered radicals attacking molecular bromine to make product plus a bromine-centered radical. And we continue to crank through that cycle again and again and again until we run out of bromine. At, go ahead. For, so um, in synthesis, of course, you don't care necessarily about showing all the details. All you care about in synthesis is what is the starting material and what is the product. So if I were to summarize this reaction in a synthesis, I would simply write this reaction like this. Okay. Now, I'm not showing you the termination step. The termination step could involve either two bromine-centered radicals fighting, finding each other, or it could involve two carbon-centered radicals finding each other. Those are our carbon-centered radicals in this reaction. If they found each other, we would make this. Do I care that there's a very small amount of this present? No. Do I need to show that as a product? No. You simply need to show the major product, which is the product that you get from alkane halogenation. All right. Um, so I actually just look at that for a minute. Um, summarized in a synthesis, and I can answer some mechanistic questions if, if you still have some, but. Look at what we've done there. We've taken an alkane. There's no reaction we've done this semester that, except for this one that has used an alkane as the starting material. An alkane with no functional groups, just CH bonds. And we've converted it into an alkyl halide. There are tons of things we know how to do with alkyl halides. Let's name a few. What, what are some things we can do with alkyl halides? Sure, you can do substitution reactions. What else? Elimination reactions. All right. Uh, I think, is that it? Is that all we've ever used them for? I mean, there's maybe a few more. Um, right, but we could, through you know, substitution reactions, we could put nucleophiles in the place of the bromo. Uh, we could put, uh, do elimination to get an alkene, and then there's other things we can do to alkenes. This has opened up a whole world of starting materials to you that you used to not be able to use because of this reaction. Um, this is an example. It's not a, 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 this radical reaction is an example of a class of reactions that are very important in organic chemistry. I don't know that you'll learn about any of them except this one uh, in, in 351 and 352. This is called an example of CH activation, where you take a CH bond that's not near any other functional group and you turn it into something that's useful. 
highly, uh, highly important, highly useful way to take relatively low value starting materials, things that you could isolate from petroleum and turn them into higher value chemicals. Um, okay, so that's radical halogenation. Let me just uh, give you a practice problem. Let's do predict products. Here is the starting material. You're going to use bromine and UV light to do a radical reaction. What is the product? Draw the product. Got it? Where's my bromo going to go? Top of the hexagon, you want it? Top of the hexagon, too. No. You want to put it right there? Okay, why should it go, why should it go there? That's right. Because that you would get, that's the product you would get if you formed the more stable more substituted radical intermediate. Let's do mechanism, actually. We don't have to show the initiation step. How would I show formation of that radical? Okay, and what kind of arrow am I gonna use? Let's play Mr. Noodle. You know what I'm, you have no idea what I'm talking about, except if you've seen Elmo's World from like 20 years ago. I'm sorry. This is where I do something wrong and you say, no, Mr. Noodle, that's not right. What's wrong about what I've done? It doesn't make a radical. That's motion of two electrons. Good. All right. It's not evil. It's just wrong. Okay. Um, so I need an arrow with one flag. And then I need an arrow from the bond between carbon and hydrogen with one flag. That communicates that the bromo radical is abstracting a hydrogen atom. Technically, this is enough. This will communicate that there's a single electron left behind on that carbon. For uh, completeness, I like to show an arrow for the other electron, just putting it back on that carbon that was involved in the carbon-hydrogen bond. But yes, that is how we show formation of the radical. Um, then how do I show formation of the alkyl bromide? No, okay, thank you. No, Mr. Noodle, thanks for indulging me. It's, um, like this, okay? The point is that in OCHEM, arrows mean something. I know when you're in a hurry, you guys like to use arrows to just remind yourself that this thing goes over here. Quit doing that. Do yourself a favor and quit doing that, all right? Use arrows to mean something. Arrows show motion of electrons. And this is how we have to show the arrows in a radical reaction. Okay. Um, this is a decent point to show you what would happen if instead of chlorine, sorry, bromine, we had used chlorine. All right, so same starting material. If we use chlorine, let me show you why it's this way. So if we have an energy diagram for the first step, first propagation step, we'll do an energy diagram for that first step. Uh, the bromine radical is relatively stable. And so uh, going 
from the bromine-centered radical to the carbon-centered radical is actually uphill in energy. Now, we learned early on this semester uh, about the Hammond postulate, which tells you that the transition state resembles whatever it's closer to in energy. In this case, the transition state is closer to the carbon-centered radical. So the transition state is very much like a carbon-centered radical, which means that whatever stabilizes the radical intermediate also stabilizes the transition state, which means that it's actually going to be faster to form the tertiary radical than it would be to form the secondary radical. Forming the secondary radical would be up here, right? I'm not going to I mean, that's, that's exaggerating. Uh, for chlorination, it turns out that um, the chlorine radical is actually higher in energy than the carbon-centered radical. Uh, what this means is that the transition state for radical chlorination is very much like a chlorine-centered radical, not like a carbon-centered radical. That means that chloro is probably indifferent in terms of reaction rate. You know, there are a lot of different kinds of radicals from this starting material, secondary radical, tertiary radical. Chloro is mostly indifferent because the transition state for radical chlorination doesn't have a lot of radical character on the carbon. It's mostly still a chlorine-centered radical. This is an example of something called the reactivity-selectivity principle. Sometimes things that are more reactive aren't very selective. The analogy is, it's a terrible analogy. I heard it 20 years ago when I took this class from my colleague and friend, Dr. Paul Savage. In his honor, I repeat it to you, but it's kind of silly because I've never actually done this in my life. But imagine you're really, really, really hungry. You open up the fridge and you just pick the first thing in there and you eat it even if it happens to be raw broccoli. Has that ever happened to anybody here? <laughs> Maybe done that before, okay. Not very common, but, but that's the idea that if you're super, super hungry, you maybe don't care about what you eat. If you are super hungry, maybe you take the time to find the chocolate ice cream in the fridge instead of the broccoli or whatnot. This is an, an, an example of that. So what you will see for radical chlorination is a mixture of products that come from all of the possible radicals that you could form along the way. So you will get the tertiary chloride, but you will also get all the other secondary chlorides and where possible their enantiomers and or diastereomers, okay? I've deliberately not shown dashes or wedges there. The lack of dashes and wedges says that when, when uh, what I've drawn is a technically would be a chiral product uh, or where they would be stereocenters, you have both possible configurations and all possible diastereomers and enantiomers. So you can see that uh, radical bromination is not as useful, or chlorination is not as useful as radical bromination. Okay, we've got just a little bit more to do next time. I'll see you then. Have a good week.